G'day everyone, I'm Ebony Bennett, Deputy Director at the Australia Institute and welcome back to Poll Position, our fortnightly catch up where we dig into the Guardian Essential poll results and take you behind the scenes in the world of politics. Thanks so much for joining us today. I want to begin by acknowledging that I live and work on Ngunnawal and Ngambri country and pay my respects to elders past and present. And days and times for webinars do vary. So head on over to australiainstitute.org.au for our upcoming webinars. Um, a few tips to make sure this all runs smoothly. You should be able to type questions in for the panel in the Q&A box. You should also be able to upvote other people's questions if you like them and leave comments on them. A reminder to please keep things civil and on topic in the chat or we'll boot you out. And finally, a reminder that this discussion is live and it is being recorded. The video will be available on uh, australiainstitute.tv later today and or actually it might be tomorrow we've got a few people off sick at the moment uh, and the audio will go up as an episode of Guardian um, Australia sorry Guardian's Australian Politics podcast uh, hopefully tomorrow for those uh, listening from the pod you can find all the results to play along at home at essentialreport.com.au so in exciting news, the new census results are out and show that millennials are taking over boomers as the biggest generation in terms of population. Finally, I can only assume that cosy tax breaks and massive wealth uh, that advantages millennials will soon follow. That's my fervent wish. Um, in less fortunate news, Varroa mites have been detected in sentinel beehives in Newcastle. Uh, I'm quietly freaking out about that in the background, one to keep an eye on. It looks like they've got it under control for the minute, but big risk to biosecurity there. Australia, of course, is having an electricity and a gas crisis probably at least a decade in the making. Our Prime Minister, Anthony Albanese, is overseas as part of the NATO summit. And Parliament, of course, is set to return soon with a lot of our new MPs um, at politician school at the moment in Parliament House. Obviously, they'll be coming back with a massively expanded crossbench. Um, and there's been a few kerfuffles this week over the personal staffing numbers, which have been cut from the previous Parliament. Guardian Essential poll results show that voters back the recent minimum wage increase, but are more divided on Labor's 2030 emissions reduction target. So to unpack all of that and more, please welcome our regular panellists, Catherine Murphy, political editor at Guardian Australia, as well as Richard Dennis, chief economist at the Australia Institute. And unfortunately, Pete Lewis is unwell today. So thankfully, we've got John Remington back from Essential Media. He's joining us today as well to go through the numbers. Welcome back, John. Hello. Thanks very much, everyone. Catherine, I'll start with you. Um, new government, a lot of stuff happening, kind of, I got the sense, a lot of uh, dumpster fires uh, upon opening the doors of the new <laughs> government. Um, perhaps we should start with the electricity crisis, but um, yeah, a, a few fires to put out, shall we say, for the new government. Sure. Speaking of dumpster fires, yes, the energy crisis. Yeah. No, I think that's uh, that's sort of quite a good way to think about it, Eb. It's sort of like witnessing this at close range. It's sort of been the new Labor administrations come in, you know, opened the doors of the kingdom and then immediately recoiled backwards at at, uh, at sort of, you know, the scope of the task, basically. Um and of course, uh, these transitions to government are always hectic and they are uh, particularly hectic in this instance that the new Labor government has wanted to do a bunch of things really over the first month uh, since taking office. So, uh, and of course, you know, sort of looping back to the point you referenced a minute ago, Ed, which is this argument about staffing for crossbenches, the government... <laughs> <laughs> the government at the moment, if you sort of ring around um, ministerial offices, people are still recruiting staff. They, they're still running with their opposition staff, basically compliment. Uh, that is uh, the, the opposition staff who do not have type A flu or COVID at this point in time. And there are a number of uh, people who have one, you know, or other of those conditions. So what I'm trying to say is it's it's all a bit hectic around the place and, uh, and a little bit extemporised. But Yes, getting back to the dumpster fire. Well, one of the critical ones has been, uh, you know, the what's what's happened in the energy market, and that's been 
uh, you know, a number of different factors that have built up over the best part of the decade. Uh, the principal one being that there hasn't been settled policy uh, sort of driving investment decisions in the energy grid over the last 10 years. And various experts on in various configurations, uh, both inside the government and outside have been warning for many, many years now that we're going to, we're going to hit the wall with this stuff uh, if we can't uh, settle uh, the climate and energy wars. And so Australians got a taste of that over the last few weeks. Obviously, there's international factors that have exacerbated conditions, the war in Ukraine and there's global supply shortages associated with that and also and also with the pandemic still and, and gas shortages in the country because a lot of gas uh, is contracted to overseas buyers. And we've got clapped out coal generators uh, spending uh, longer periods offline, so they're not available to generate power. And we had a cold snap. So everybody in the country turned on their heaters and and the, you know, it, the national electricity market wobbled uh, in a way that was deeply uncomfortable for Chris Bowen, the new minister, trying to manage that. And there was a significant intervention in, uh, by, by the market operator, basically, to keep the lights on, to make sure that uh, we could get through this, this really tricky couple of weeks. Um, so that was pretty heavy duty for a new minister coming in, being sworn in, how do you like this? Thanks very much. And, uh, and also that new minister is, is also running at speed because the government, I think, would like to bring in some legislation in the, in the opening week of the 47th parliament, which is the final week in July, giving effect to its medium term emissions reduction target, this 43% cut. So all of that's being worked up in the background as well. Uh, as is sort of concrete options for how you actually achieve your targets. So that's adjustments to the safeguard mechanism and other things. So look, these guys, you know, their bums haven't touched a chair really for the best part of, of five weeks as they're kind of running to try and set up as much of this as possible. And, and that's only, that's just only one issue that, that's happened over the last four weeks. Uh, you know, Jim Chalmers in Treasury is sort of all of a sudden looking at uh, some expenditure they had a handle on and a lot of expenditure they didn't in terms of the budget um, and, you know, wants to make, again, wants to make an economic statement to Parliament when it opens at the end of the month, sort of bringing Australians up to speed before an October budget. Uh, Penny Wong has been pinging around the region, um, you know, at, at sort of velocity. Uh, obviously, there's been an outbreak of strategic competition in the region between China and and, and Australia, I guess, in terms of at, at, at the diplomatic end of things. And that's sort of the... But the, she the also of, had a lot of um, fences to mend. Well, exactly. The place as well. <laughs> exactly. exactly. It was the I love you tour. Um, yes. So, so that's been, yeah, I, I, I've now actually lost track of how many uh, overseas trips Penny Wong's done over the last month. And she's currently uh, in Malaysia and Vietnam. Vietnam. So anyway, yeah, it's been hectic, Eb. I think that's the way to describe it. I think it's been yeah. hectic. Lots of dumpster fires, lots of fire extinguishers, uh, occasional land smoldering. smoldering. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we, you've got the metaphor. Yeah. Um, before we jump into the um, poll results, Richard, I might um, come to you. I know you've written a lot about gas in particular, and we're hearing a lot from various commentators, uh, definitely not Catherine Murphy, but <laughs> that we've got a gas shortage and we just need to, you know, drill for more gas um, in particular to help with gas prices. Um, can you just tell us a little bit about how we got into this situation and whether or not drilling for more gas is actually <laughs> going to help? Sure. Um, look, to be clear, uh, there is no crisis. We're actually going very well according to the gas industry's plan. Uh, for more than a decade, this has been the goal to maximise the profits of the Australian gas industry by selling all of the gas they sell in Australia at much higher world prices, whereas they used to sell it at basically the cost of production here in Australia. So there is no crisis. This was the plan. Some people might not like the consequences of the plan, but it is going according to plan. 
the plan was so big that it cost $80 billion, $80 billion to build 11 Eiffel Towers worth of steel into refrigerators in Gladstone to $80 billion, more steel than I think seven uh, Empire State buildings got built to create this opportunity for the gas industry. And that was to link up the Australian East Coast gas market to the world market so that they could both sell more gas and they could sell the gas that they used to sell for, for three bucks a gigajoule to us for 10, 20, 30 bucks a gigajoule, whatever they could get. So there's no crisis. We just don't like the plan. Uh, and, you know, go back and look at what Martin Ferguson uh, said when he was the minister. Go back and look at what Ian McFarlane said when he was the resources minister. This was a huge opportunity for Australia, <laughs> what, what we're now describing as a crisis. And then, of course, at the same time that we've got these record prices for gas, the, the thing we're not allowed to say out loud in Australia is that apart from the old creaking coal-fired power stations that Catherine talked about, is that climate change and flooding and record rainfall is the reason that the coal supply has been disrupted and is, is a significant factor to the fact that, uh, that there's not so much coal-fired generation at the moment. So the expensive gas, well, that was part of the plan. The, the shortfalls with coal are partly because they're old and need to be phased out quickly and partly because this is what climate change looks like. We blame climate change and floods for the price of lettuce, but we're not blaming climate change and flood for what's happening in the Australian electricity market right now, which is critical infrastructure was inundated and transport routes were disrupted by record rainfalls and floods. Yeah, um, I'm sure we'll get back to this because we've got um, a few questions in there I know about it. But John, we might go now to uh, the essential poll results. Can people see this? Sorry. Yeah, yep. there we go. Um, so kicking us off, we are post-election now. What do these results show us about uh, how people feel we're settling into that new Yeah, result? and I think that's it. What we saw, we tracked this before the election and uh, we do have some longer time periods than what we've shown on here, but particularly pre and post-election, what we have seen is a shift in mentality from the country. Um, I think going into the election, one of the... Um, I think the lines from the coalition at the time was that the Labour aren't ready to govern, they're not qualified or um, capable. But what we've seen post-election is very much that the issues that of making the new cycle and the position of the Labour government is leading people to think actually we're more along on the right track than on the wrong, on the wrong track as we were beforehand. Mm. So a slight increase with the right track, but really it's up 42%. We're, this is the, we're not on the right wrong track, dropping down to 27, 29. So an umbrella, I think, um, result, which covers all the things that we're going to talk about and that Catherine and Richard have already mentioned, is that on the issues that are coming up and the way the government's dealing with them, generally people are happy with um, how it's going. Um, so we'll kick off with international relations. As Catherine mentioned, Penny Wong has definitely been on a uh, please love us tour, come back to us tour. Um, what, do we, what do we see here in these results? Yeah, I think this is, we, we talked here about having a more assertive role, which about two thirds of people agree with just in the two thirds, and looking for opportunities for cooperation. Now, what I think we didn't ask here is necessarily having a more aggressive position, or which was possibly more along the lines of the previous administration. But certainly, I think what Penny Wong's been doing on her tour as well is asserting the position whilst also building some of those bridges that Catherine mentioned. And generally, that's in line with what people would want and expect of Australia's foreign policy. Yeah, and you've got a bit of a follow-up question here, I guess, about um, people's attitudes towards which countries or regions it's important for Australia to have a close relationship with. The USA coming in at the top there um, mm -hmm. and Pacific nations not far behind. Yeah, I think that's really quite encouraging for the closest neighbours, but obviously perhaps less um, economically important, but strategically and at least within the region, 
78% uh, of people acknowledging the importance of those relations. Um, the USA, we've asked questions about this relationship before, and obviously not necessarily the major trade partner, but sorry, the most important trade partner, but major trade, cultural, and also military partner, really important to maintain the relations there. Um, I think, you know, again, we've We've had uh, more of a deep dive on relationships with China in the past, and again, we see more splits there, particularly to do with age, where young people see China as more of an opportunity, more of an opportunity for co cooperation, whereas old people perhaps are a bit more reserved with the relationship there. Mm. And we did include Russia, and obviously um, what's happening at the minute, and yes, very frosty relations with um, Russia at the minute. Yeah, very understandable results there. Um, moving on to our electricity and gas crisis or the gas plan, as Richard <laughs> described it. Um, uh, you ask people, what's your closest view on the reason for the current electricity and gas crisis? What came out at the top there? Yeah, I, I think this is a particularly interesting one. We did see a split across the results. Um, no dominant view. Now, obviously, it's a complex issue. We did um, conflate the issues of affecting electricity and gas together. And as Richard talked about, there are two quite distinct issues um, that are affecting them. But overall, there isn't a national narrative which is coming out. What we did see, which is the breakdown on the right, which is quite interesting, is that for Labour vote, or people who said they voted Labour at the last election, they see that as the direct inf um, intervention of fossil fuel lobby and liberal policy. Coalition voters, or people who voted for the Liberal and National Party the last time, they see it more to do with these unforeseen circumstances to try to perhaps deflect responsibility of blame for the previous 10 years of administration. Greens are kind of split all the way down, so they are seeing the neglect and the lack of investment in the infrastructure, but also the policy for the Liberal Party and the minor parties, which now we have to, you know, we should acknowledge include a, particularly a lot of those teal independent voters, but also One Nation and um, UAP, they really see it as that neglect of successive governments. So potentially an opposite opportunity for the Labour um, government now to try and um, recorrect the course of those. Yeah, and I might just take us to this question around the emissions target and we'll jump back out again. But here you've asked um, what people think the government should do regarding Australia's emissions targets. Uh, mm -hmm. Take us through these results. Again, I think what we, we whenever we ask climate uh, or emissions targets, we immediately see this polarised view of people who have very clear ideas. We have people who are very um, for creating more ambitious targets, people who are your more traditional climate change denialists on the other side, and they're typically, I think, are around um, 10 to 15 percent. So overall, yes, people want to see the policies at the election, but there is a sizable minority, a third of people who say that should be more ambitious targets. That is your younger voters and um, Australians, that is Labour and Greens voters, that is in a people living in metropolitan areas and people with a higher level of education, so university educated people. So certainly there's a a desire amongst those people to see more ambitious targets, but realistically, even within that 49% of keeping to what it took to the election, there will be people who even then think that's too much. And obviously, um, with what Peter Dutton has announced, his opposition to anything coming in this month, he's, that's who he's appealing to. Yeah. And just finally, um, pretty big support for the minimum wage increase here. Yeah, we ran through those slides very quickly there, Ebony. Um, <laughs> This is really good to see um, for any long term people who are watching this, we often see agreement kind of so often centering around the middle so somewhat supports having a high percentage than strongly supports somewhat oppose having a higher percentage than strongly opposed. 44 percent strongly opposing this this looks like a home run for um, Anthony Albanese and the government in his first four weeks. Huge amount of support, support higher amongst people who are going to benefit from this. So casual um, part time workers, people on, on the, um, working on the 34 hours, 35 hours a week um, and uh, people who are obviously employed and lower income. So, yes, almost 
as close as we're probably going to get to unanimous support for something, I think we'll see here. Yeah, 44% strongly supporting. That's just such a, a clear backing uh, for this, probably uh, long overdue. Um, I will take us out there. Thanks so much for taking us through those um, results, John. Catherine, I want to pick up with you um, on the electricity and gas crisis stuff um, again, but also that um, idea around what should happen with Labor's emissions targets. So Obviously, um, obviously, uh, Peter Dutton is wanting less ambition and the Greens and uh, independents are pushing for far more ambition. Where do you think things are going to land? Mm, well, it's, sort of, it's just going to be an interesting dynamic in this parliament because the Australian people have returned a more progressive parliament uh, this time, certainly than 2019. It's a you know, you could see this election as a massive correction for the result in 2019, perhaps. But anyway, it's certainly uh, a more progressive parliament. Uh, Labor has the numbers to control the House of Representatives in their own right and will obviously need to negotiate with Senate actors uh, in order to get its agenda passed. Um, so I, th I think, uh, you know, if we sort of step back a fraction from the mechanics of the of the parliament and we look at the election and we look at Labor's pathway to victory in the election. Uh, Labor would not have won this year uh, in, this, in this election in its own right had it not been able to hold a combination of traditional blue collar territory coupled with advances in uh, metropolitan inner city contests. So it wasn't a sort of, um, you know, we, we were talking during the campaign, weren't we, about uh, Boris Johnson and the Red Wall strategy. It's not like Labor parted company with its traditional blue collar working base. It tried to sort of um, come up with some messages that enabled it to hold its traditional territories and hold and gain in the inner cities. Although in Brisbane, obviously the, the Greens, um, advanced on Labor in inner city Brisbane, which was actually quite interesting, fascinating, particularly when you think about the result in 2019. Definitely. So that's a long preamble, which is me saying um, there will be pressure in this more progressive parliament for Labor to uh, up the level of ambition in terms of targets and so on and so forth. Um, I think Labor will be very reluctant to do that because uh, Labor has spent the last 10 years um, basically as, you know, in a hostage situation in the climate wars. Uh, it's it managed in this election campaign to, to thread that needle that I just spoke about, which is its traditional blue collar territory with uh, progressive aspirational people in metropolitan contests. It's, it's sort of, you know, through a combination of policy and, me and messaging it kind of hit, you know, it, it, it created a pathway to 77 seats, which is what, which is where they landed. And obviously that's quite a narrow margin. Um, if we were talking about, you know, if this was a normal government scenario where the crossbench hadn't just been radically expanded, we'd all be saying, people like me would all be saying, oh my God, Anthony Albanese controls this on a, you know, there's a hair's breadth between him and oblivion, right? Uh, but we now have the Teals who are effectively a buffer state <laughs> between uh, Labor and the coalition, which is really quite fascinating and worthy of a whole uh, episode in its own right. But I'm just sort of trying to paint a, a biggish picture for people here. So, look, I think Labor will be very keen to be seen to implementing what it told voters it would do. I think they will be very highly attentive to that. But there will be pressure uh, in the Senate and in the lower house uh, for Labor to, you know, be as ambitious as, as possible in relation to climate and energy policy. Now, how might Labor thread that needle? Well, that'll be the story of the next three years in essence. But there are ways and means, I think, of working around that. Obviously, you can legislate a 43% target and you can also create some accompanying structures and mechanisms around that that makes it clear that you want, you want ambition, right? 
uh, that 43% are, you know, a floor, not a ceiling. Like that, you know, Labor isn't going to start sort of stopping people reducing emissions in the event that people, you know, double down on their transformation strategies in order to hit net zero emissions by 2050. So I think there's ways and means of trying to step around some of these difficulties. But it will be, look, the opening test of the new parliament will be in the event uh, Chris Bowen gets his legislation together for his 43% and that lobs in the first week, in the first sitting week in July or shortly thereafter, there will obviously be a vote. Peter Dutton has locked in the coalition to opposing a 43% emissions reduction target, which has greatly annoyed some of his colleagues, despite the fact the moderate wing of the Liberal Party was, well, not wiped out, but certainly had a, had a very substantial blow in the election campaign. There are a number of Liberals who are annoyed with Peter Dutton at two levels. One, there's been no actual conversation post-election about what role climate change may have played in this result, and also whether or not they need to think about the policy, but also, you know, for people who are not necessarily caught up in climate change as an issue, there's a lot of people very annoyed about captain's calls that Peter Dutton has opened the Liberal leadership by declaring what will happen yeah. uh, ahead of shadow cabinet or, or um, party room discussions. Anyway, let's not get caught up there. But Peter Dutton for now is saying no on 43%. What Peter Dutton wants to do for the next three years is to take inflation and cost of living pressures and, and, and basically staple them to Labor's 43% emissions reduction target and blame any cost increases at all in the economy on that and hopefully then, you know, come back into Labor's blue collar territory and start to swap some seats. That's his political strategy. It's as obvious as the nose on his face. In terms of what happens with others, well, uh, you know, the Greens will have to decide, I guess, um, you know, how to manage uh, their own position. And a bad will have to make a decision about whether or not the Greens bank the 43, as in support the 43, but make it very clear that the Greens' position validly in terms of the science is for a more ambitious target or whether we see a vote with the Liberals and the Greens on the same side in one of the chambers in the parliament. So anyway, all of this will play out over the coming weeks. I don't know how it'll play out. Um, Adam Bant is at the moment on a really well-deserved holiday. I mean, Bant and the Greens had a sensational campaign and they must be exhausted. And he's actually taking a break at this point in time. But I will be very interested see how that that plays out in terms of an, uh, an opening sortie in the parliament possibly too much information there but that <laughs> <laughs> no we love to be uh better informed and good to get the lay of the land ahead of um of the next parliament um beginning to sit um it did just make me think ben o'christ our executive director keeps talking about why we keep talking about the climate wars? It felt more like a hostage situation. Oh. Oh, well, ben, to be clear, Ben and I have not shared that <laughs> shared that sensation. But given both of our histories, is it any wonder that we've that we that that's the that's the metaphor we reach for? It has yeah, been no, a definitely not. Yeah. Um, Richard, I wanted to ask you about the minimum wage decision, and we've really seen um, an outbreak of. Um, uh, basically um, people blaming uh, wage increases and a potential wage increase or, or pay, pay rises for potential inflation and we're warning about um, the impact that that would have on inflation, which is obviously running much stronger than anyone would want to see. Can you just take us through the actual economics of this moment and how um, pay increases do or don't fit into that inflation story? Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, let's start with the politics. I mean, what do we do in Australia? Victim blame. Like whether it's whether it's wages, whether it's unemployment, whether it's blackouts, you know, we just find the vulnerable group and blame them for any big problem. So, of course, here we are with imported inflation. The, the reason inflation has surged is because world energy prices have risen uh, because of decisions made in Australia when world energy prices rise, our domestic energy prices rise um, because of COVID and supply chain related problems, particularly with silicon chips and in the building industry, costs have gone up. So we've had, let's be clear, we've had 10 years of low wage growth, 10 years of low wage growth. We've had 10 years of the profit share of GDP rising. 
And we just saw prices surge uh, 5% in the most recent uh, accounts. So even though we've had 10 years of low wage growth, when prices surge 5%, everyone went, oh, wage price spiral, wage price spiral. There's no wage price spiral because prices have surged. And let's be clear, profits have surged because lots of firms are increasing their prices way above uh, increases in costs. So if there's any spiraling going on at the moment, it's a price profit spiral. And then over here, we've got workers whose real wages have just fallen significantly. And of course, everyone's pointing the finger at them and saying, now, if you even try and achieve nominal uh, a real wage uh, stability, if you just kind of ask for as much as the rate of inflation, not an increase in real wages, which is what the RBA was targeting only four months ago, if you so much as ask for an inflation-linked wage rise, you'll be causing inflation. I mean, it's just nonsense, but it's nonsense spoken by powerful people in defense of powerful interests, which will help further increase the profit share of GDP. So you bet there's going to be a lot of people out there cheering that analysis on. Uh, but it's clearly, uh, it's clear that, in, that, that wages haven't caused this bout of inflation. There's no evidence at all that if we, re if we responded to a one-off shock in energy prices with a one-off increase in wages, um, that's not a spiral, that's a catch up <laughs> to, to kind of catastrophize forward uh, is, is just hiding people's distributional preferences behind some sort of, you know, smug sounding concern for the economy. But again, we've been blaming the unemployed for macroeconomic policies that cause unemployment for decades. Why wouldn't we cause, low, why wouldn't we blame low paid workers wanting a wage rise uh, for causing inflation when when it's prices that are doing it. Yeah, uh, I'm sure we'll come back to that in the questions, but I am going to go now to questions from our audience um, and I'm going to use my liberties as host to pick a topic that I want to talk about. Mel Smith has said in uh, light of the Roe v. Wade decision, uh, in the United States, that is the Supreme Court overturning the constitutional right to abortion and termination services in the United States. Um, uh, and what impact will this have in Australia? Catherine, uh, can I throw to you if you've got um, any responses um, on that? And the Mel particularly wanted to know, do you think it will have an impact on the conservative movement here in Australia? Mm -hmm. Well, look, I, I uh hopefully it'll have uh no impact in australia uh apart from obviously the horror of uh uh you know of women at uh the erosion of a right uh in the united states that has been you know fought for over generations of you know women and and allies of women it is the most extraordinary uh, reversal and uh, and just you know I, I actually haven't been able to read a lot about it because I find it really distressing uh, uh, because it's you know if you understand the history of that debate and how hard won reproductive rights for women has you know as as individual entities rather than property owned by husbands or or others uh, you realize just what a setback that is uh and uh and yeah anyway i find it very distressing in terms of australia uh well look it'll be one of those you know sort of um you know i'd call it bobblehead uh responses where uh you know people will try and make a bit of a culture war out of it i think at the margins i think there will be a bit of that uh people sort of uh you know trying to sort of um stir up a debate here I think we'll probably see a bit of that at the margins but so far we haven't seen a lot of it which is gratifying uh you know the, the even quite conservative politicians at least uh people that I've seen over the last couple of days have been quite measured in the way they've responded to those events so um look sensible people in the political system in Australia will not want to open this debate up sensible people on all sides will not want to open up a debate about this. 
uh, but I, given that there is a lot of, uh, you know, sort of performative posturing at the fringes of part of politics in Australia and elsewhere, I think we'd be naive to expect that, you know, that that nobody will talk about this, that nobody will make an issue of this, nobody will try and advance their own profile by getting out and yabbering about this. But you know, fingers crossed, fingers crossed. It'll be uh, it'll be uh, at the margins, and also interestingly, there's been a bit of a discussion uh, since the uh, the ruling in the states just about uh, inequities in reproductive services in Australia, uh, which has been quite interesting uh, because yeah. again, it's, it's not a topic that um, uh, that uh, that politics likes to ventilate much in public. Not actually for actually for good reasons, I think. Uh, I don't think anyone's shying away from the complexity of the issues, but also I think there, there has been culturally a reluctance in Australia just to elevate this as another culture war. Um, and sometimes, uh, I know it seems very strange, but sometimes the best way to preserve a right is not to be banging on about it all the time. Um, but, uh, you know, anyway, I think that whole debate, though, about some inequities in the Australian system, particularly for women trying to secure reproductive services, professional termination services in regional areas, for example, has been fascinating to me. I didn't know a lot about that really until I started hearing some of the conversation over the last couple of days. So, yeah. And distressingly, it often, um, you know, uh, can turn on whether or not your particular GP Yes, backs yes. it or not, which is yes. uh, alarming in itself. But just for people um, who might not be uh, very au fait with this debate, obviously um, it's a direct threat to the health of women and women will probably die and be injured in birth in greater numbers because of this decision. Around half the states in the United States have trigger laws that will outright ban abortion and um Another thing that I think people have been worried about in the United States as well as here is basically just this idea that, yeah, a right that's been settled for 50 years can be overturned and at least one of those Supreme Court justices has said same-sex marriage and um, access to contraception is potentially next on the chopping block. So uh, I think a lot to be on the lookout for essentially there, um, but a good point about avoiding the culture war, Catherine. Just very quickly, Ed, not to not to detain us, but just there's just that issue in America at the moment. Obviously, there's been a debate for some period of time about how uh, the the United States is increasingly not one country, but but certainly two countries, and probably many more living in this you know sort of uneasy truce with one another in terms of economic and cultural values. There there is a very interesting piece that that's not. Um, Roe v. Wade related, but I would just recommend to people watching on today in the Atlantic, uh, where there was, it, it's it's not about abortion rights, it's about, uh, it was a, just a very good analysis, Richard, I'm sure would approve of, um, you know, of, of the actual real world differences between red and blue states in, in the US in terms of economic opportunities and outcomes. Uh, it's anyway. It's in the Atlantic. I, 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 I might just, but while Richard's talking, I might just at least give you a headline in a minute that would enable you to search for it if you wanted to read it. It's just quite an interesting piece about the sort of uh, the structural things sitting underneath the, you know, the dialogue in the US, which has led us to this moment. And uh, anyway, I just think it's quite helpful to people. So. And I interrupted Richard. So uh, while, you, while I I will look for that headline while you uh, while you actually uh, say what you wanted to say before I rudely interrupted you. No, no worries. Um, look, I, I guess I just wanted to quickly say. I mean, apart from sharing everyone's uh, horror at what's happening in the US, I think it's important to say in Australia some of that culture war stuff has already started. I've seen some conservatives saying. Luckily, the Australian constitution is based on the British constitution, so these things couldn't happen here, which is odd because there is no British constitution, uh, and indeed the Australian constitution was largely shaped uh, by our understanding of the US constitution. So that culture war part has already started. And then in terms of access, I think it's really important in Australia, uh, and it's, you know, I think now's a good time to, to have this debate and push for it. But it's not just people living in regional Australia who miss out. Abortions are very expensive in Australia. 
And in some communities, the, the taxpayer relies on faith-based hospitals to provide public care. Uh, and Catholic care services, for example, might choose not to offer abortions, which has enormous consequences in some regions. So because we don't rely on our public institutions to, re pro to provide so many public health services, uh, a whole bunch of things relating to reproductive rights in Australia are actually governed by who happens to have the contract, not just what the rules are. Yeah. Um, and Catherine, that's not the only thing in the Atlantic that I would recommend people read. I was actually having a browse myself. And um, and there was one also that looked at uh, how America wasted its chance to push the economy forward that sounded like something Richard would have written. Um, right yeah, on, but, yeah um, that's very on brand for Richard. <laughs> the piece I was thinking about for folks who are interested and want to look this up, the headline on it is America is growing apart possibly for good. And uh, the, the person who reported the piece is someone called uh, Ronald Brownstein. I just thought it was a really good piece of work. Excellent. Um, the next question that I've got here is uh, from John Knox. Richard, I might direct this one to you first. Um, exactly why is the government so loath to strike a super profits tax on gas and coal mines? Yes, I know they said they wouldn't have any new taxes, but is this an extraordinary situation? Well, it is an extraordinary situation and it's also an extraordinary opportunity because if we were to introduce a super profits tax, the government could collect a lot of revenue uh, and it could spend that money if it wanted to on actually lowering our cost of living. Like we've seen how cutting, uh, you know, making childcare free lowers inflation. We know that if we made aged care cheaper or medicines cheaper, we could directly push inflation down. And I think that unfortunately in Australia, we have this very old fashioned, I'd argue, but very narrow sense of economic policy and inflations, are, are, you use interest rates, that's the one lever you use for inflation and you balance the budget over here. And you know, actually we need to be far more creative. And I think a super profits tax is not just a good idea and not just equitable. And you know that lefty Boris Johnson even introduced one in the UK but it would actually allow the government to solve a couple of other problems at the same time. It's also important to point out that one of the few kind of areas for wriggle room uh, that um, Jim Chalmers left himself pre-election in terms of revenue was multinationals and tacking, cracking down on multinational tax evasion. And as some research from the Australian Institute out a week or two ago showed, around 97% of the gas industry in Australia is foreign owned. So I think, you know, unfortunately, I, I see why Labor went to the election with such kind of narrow guide rails, but the, the one kind of get out of jail free card they left for themselves was multinational tax evasion. And we've got multinational companies in Australia selling tens of billions of dollars worth of oil and gas, not paying any tax. And if that's not multinational tax evasion, I don't know what is, and a super profits tax you know, and now, you know, you've got Ken Henry supporting that. So it's taken a while, but we're winning them over, Ed. <laughs> um, the next question I've got is from Alistair McCulloch. Um, Catherine, I might direct this one to you. Uh, he's interested in the views on the cuts to the crossbench staffing allowance. Uh, his first thought is that without staff who can undertake research for them on policy issues, the crossbench is likely to rely um, more heavily on interest groups and lobbyists for their research and information, and thereby more likely to be captured by those interests. Do you have any thoughts on that, Catherine? Well, I think, look, uh, uh, I think there is a bigger conversation that we ought to have, quite frankly, about resourcing our democracy. Um, obviously, there's a stink about cutting back staff for... Um, independence, and I completely understand and subscribe to the view that uh, independents require uh, in-house expertise in order to assess the complex legislative proposals that come before them over the life of a government. So, you know, I'm, I think I think they should have a, a decent number of staff. But I think what people in the, in the general community don't always necessarily understand is that the whole system is under-resourced in terms of staffing. This, it's sort of this zero-sum 
transaction that's going on at the moment, right? Obviously, the government, one of the dumpster fires, going back to where you started, Ev, that, uh, you know, when, the, when, when Labor arrived, opened the door and went, oh, my God, and shut the door more quickly again. One of the dumpster fires, obviously, is, you know, is expenditure and getting back to Richard's point. I mean, the, you know, the, obviously, the budget has a revenue problem and there's a whole conversation that's going to have to go on about that over this term of government. But just at the micro level in your parliament, in, in the place where laws are made, in the people's house, it is my view that we should resource our democracy properly. And one of the reasons we don't is because journalists, you know, uh, write stories about, oh my God, you know, the prime minister's got 40 staff, you know, as if this is a thought crime. I mean, it's not. You know, the Prime Minister is like the chief executive of the country. I mean, it, it has amazed me for as long as I have been in Canberra how much gets done with how few people in this system. And, of course, we had, a, we had an inquiry last year about the, the toxic workplace culture in Parliament House that may, in fact, speak to that in terms of staff that are being pushed to work unmanageable hours with dealing with unmanageable levels of stress, uh, perhaps some of the, the cultural problems that, are, that build up around the building may in fact relate to that. I don't know, just speculating. So or, what I'm saying is, look, there is a legit issue here, obviously about whether the crossbench is resourced adequately, but I think there are ways and means of doing that, which is getting a bit lost in how blunt this argument is. You know, I had four staff last time, so I want four staff now. Okay, fair enough. If I were them, I would I would be saying the same thing. But there's probably ways where you could actually, uh, you know, sort of if you're a bit creative, work around the actual headcount issue or the salary issue. But I just think there's a whole sleeper issue sitting there that that doesn't get ventilated. That is about the resourcing of of democracy and parliament and political parties more generally. I mean, political parties now are just on this travelator of fundraising. Everybody is because there's not enough public resourcing of elections and, and, and politics. Like, it, you know, it all matters, this stuff. Representative democracy matters. And, you know, and we're basically, you know, it's a bit like the, the national electricity grid. It's all held together with Durex, you know, bobby pins and rubber bands. I mean, it's like, it's, it is a miracle what happens here given how few people are involved in making the sausages. So while validating the independence point, I guess I would just encourage people listening today just to broaden out their consciousness. I think there is an issue here across the board that doesn't necessarily stop at the door of the independence. Yeah, you don't necessarily want to be running your democracy on the smell of an oily rag. That's a very good point. Well, it's what happens. Like it it is what happens. And I mean, more doesn't mean better. Obviously, you know, everybody in every workplace in the country has got to work very hard. You know, we, it's, it's what, that's what is required. I'm not shrieking about, you know, about hard work. I'm sort of into it myself. But I just think it's like there, there's, a bigger, there's a bigger thing here to look at, guys, and I encourage you to look at it. Um, Catherine's made a really good point there, Richard, but I want to bring the tone down a bit and ask about the politics of this decision. <laughs> um, <laughs> I would have thought that um, Labor's a little bit shooting itself in the foot here. Isn't it in Labor's interests for the teal independents to be politically politically successful in this parliament so they get re-elected and keep the coalition out of government? I would have thought that was an equation Labor might be thinking of when looking at this kind of stuff. Uh, look, I think there's an element of that in there, um, but I guess you know, let's let's you, know, you want to bring the tone down. Let's let's go all the way to the bottom. Let, let's assume that they're being brutally pragmatic and thinking, well, okay, all of those teals will have, uh, you know, four um, four electorate staff and one maybe two advisors. That's a lot more than any liberals running against them is going to have. So that'll give those existing independents a huge advantage over any liberal campaign that may or may not emerge in those electorates. Uh, they probably don't want to give five staff uh, of uh, Di League who defeated Christina Keneally. They perhaps don't want to give her five staff to make it harder for Labor to win back off them at the, off her at the next election. Uh, but also I think this is a prime minister sending a very loud signal at the beginning of three years of power politics that, 
for anyone that thinks he's beholden to this crossbench, he's make it pretty clear that he doesn't think he is. And, you know, let's, let's be clear. He does have a majority in the lower house uh, and he will be able to pass legislation, whether they vote against it or not. So uh, I, I agree with most of what Catherine said. I think perhaps we don't realize how few personal staff the you know ministers in England have. I think people might be a bit surprised to see how other countries' uh, democracies work. But here in Australia, with the systems we've got, with a so-called public service that's so politicised, it would be heresy to say that the public service could meaningfully brief the opposition or the crossbench on how legislation works, because you know they're actually a ministerial service, not a public service in Australia. Uh, so given all the kind of constraints that independents face, I absolutely think that they need staff to do their job well. But I, I don't think that this is an accident uh, from Anthony Albanese. I think he's he's sent a very loud signal uh, about, you know, that, that that he'll be running the show and that he's not beholden to the crossbench. And, you know, will some of that come back to bite him? Perhaps. But, you know, really, I think Labor don't expect to be chasing those teal seats uh, at the next election. And they're probably thinking Dutton's not going to be chasing them either. Mm. Uh, the next question I've got is from John, who asks, last week, the new resources minister, Madeline King, said the government is seriously considering signing on to the global methane pledge to cut methane emissions by 30% by 2030. Catherine, do you think sign on is likely? Well, she said that in an interview with Guardian Australia. And in fact, with me. <laughs> Sorry to toot my own little horn there. But yeah, anyway, she did say that. I was surprised, actually, because I thought, given, uh, I mean, look, uh, Australia failing to sign the methane pledge was an issue in Glasgow, among many issues, uh, which put us as, uh, what does the Prime Minister say, that we, we, we've been in the naughty corner or, you know, what, whatever his preferred description of, uh, you know, of international pariah almost, um, you know, yes, that's true. Like uh, Biden made a big thing of it in Glasgow at the at the UN uh, climate talks last year. More than 100, 100 countries signed on. Australia did not. Uh, Australia didn't sign on. One, because Morrison had sort of, ex had, uh, I suppose, cashed in the, all, all the sort of latitude that he'd been given by the National Party and others to sort of look as though we were increasing ambition in Glasgow, which was, you know, the transaction of much of the last year in office for Morrison was being able to go to Glasgow with something to say, even though the government wasn't planning on actually doing anything meaningful. But anyway, put that to one side. We didn't sign the methane pledge because the National Farmers Association, the, the National Farmers Federation is dead against it, absolutely dead against it. Uh, also, the gas industry, because like the methane pledge, basically that, you know, the, the most affected sectors from Australia signing the methane pledge are agriculture and gas, because it's, methane is a uh, you know, very potent greenhouse gas that's produced in extractive industries, as well as agricultural processes. Again, long preamble. Um, look, they're clearly looking at it seriously. I don't know whether they'll do it or not. Uh, Madeleine King volunteered this. I obviously asked her the question because I remember the debates around the methane pledge when I was in Glasgow last year. Um, I asked her whether or not this was something Labor would look at. She said, yes, we are looking at that actively, uh, but also, you know, just to make sure that no one in the gas industry went, you know, nuts or anyone in the farm lobby went nuts. She said, we'll also embark on a very serious uh, consultation or we're in the, in the process of consulting with affected sectors. So, yeah, look, it's a bit too soon, I think, to say whether or not they'll do it, but they are certainly actively looking at it. And, uh, and in part because, uh, you know, to Eb's point about, um, you know, and my point earlier about the Please Like Me tour of Pacific and other and other areas, the new government, the new Labor government is using climate policy, it's more ambitious climate policy as a point of entry into a number of relationships at this point in time. Also, the world is relieved. Anybody who understands, you know, what's happened in climate policy in Australia in the last 12 months is absolutely dead set relieved to see, uh, you know, an election cycle like the one we've just had embolden the government to have some ambition to, to take into global processes. Tanya Plibersek, the new environment minister, 
you know, got a very rousing uh, welcome at the Oceans Conference in Portugal yesterday. Um, the world is genuinely very glad to see Australia back at the climate change table in terms of international negotiations. So look, the methane is the methane pledge is important to Biden and other allies. That'll be why the new government's looking at it. There are some fairly noisy and politically influential uh, sectors who, you know, are going to be quite toey about this. So a bit too soon to say whether they'll do it. But again, they are certainly looking at it. Yeah. Richard, anything to add to that on gas and methane? Well, look, I, I hope they do commit, make that commitment. But let's be clear, liquefied natural gas is liquefied methane. Australia is the largest exporter of liquefied methane in the world. And the reason we want to open up the Betaloo Basin, the reason we want to open up Scarborough is because we want to extract a lot more methane. So you bet the gas industry will fight tooth and nail uh, to protect their right to massively increase methane emissions. Uh, so, yeah, great that the government's even holding that open. But to be clear, liquefied natural gas is liquefied methane and we 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 are this is what we're being told we need to drill more of to solve our energy crisis brackets not a crisis it's a plan so yeah i think there's a pretty big mixed signal there i'll focus on the optimistic bit and say great we're going to make a pledge but when we drill for methane a lot of it leaks out called fugitive emissions and of course the whole point of drilling for it is so that someone else can burn it so Yes, we need to rapidly transfer, uh, trans, uh, transition away from methane. Um, but uh, at the moment, Australia, as we want to build 20 new coal mines in New South Wales, we still want to develop enormous new gas extraction. And you know, at some point, we have to admit there's a complete disconnect between saying reducing our domestic fossil fuel use with a 43% target means tackling climate change when we want to double our gas exports. And also worth remembering that actually we use a huge amount of that gas just to export it, much more than we use, for example, in our manufacturing industry. Yeah. So the, the industry the light, itself, yeah. Yeah, the, the, you know, that I said before, 11 Eiffel Towers worth of steel to make a refrigerator, those sites, the, the compression and refrigeration of methane, that is the largest single use of methane in Australia. So we use more methane to compress the methane we export than we use for all industry combined. And I promise you that during the gas crisis, brackets, not a crisis of plan, that not for a second did we stop burning enormous amounts of gas to liquefy the gas before it could be exported. The power stations ran short, the factories ran short, the largest refrigerators in the world we're running at 103% capacity. Well, I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap it up there. There were some other great questions in there. I'm sorry, as usual, that we can't get to all of them, but we really appreciate how much you guys all participate in this discussion and throw us um, amazing and interesting topics to cover. It's always uh, a delight to speak to you all. Um, uh, thank you so much, Catherine Murphy, Richard Dennis, and John Remington. Uh, don't forget to head on over to Essential Media to find uh, all those slides. You can find Catherine's coverage of the Guardian Essential Poll results in today's Guardian. And uh, I'm sure if you uh, look it up on there, you can find her um, interview with Madeline King as well. We'll try and um, put links into those couple of Atlantic articles that we were talking to and a few other things that we referred to as well. We had uh, close to 600 people on the line with us today. Thanks so much for joining us. Don't forget you can find uh, all of our content up on australiainstitute.tv and don't forget to subscribe to our podcast, Follow the Money, and you can always catch up with this on The Guardian's uh, podcast as well head on over to our website, australiainstitute.org.au for future webinars. And if you're there, if you can, perhaps chip into our end of financial year appeal. We would certainly very much appreciate it. Thanks for tuning in today. Stay safe out there, everyone. Try and avoid getting COVID or the flu. Both are pretty nasty and both are going around. And we'll see you in a fortnight, fortnight's time. Thanks very much, everyone. Bye.